Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello and welcome to the lecture on gender, gender and literature where we're looking at a text called Heart of Darkness. So uh, as you remember, we had covered two texts before this. So we had covered uh, Munshi Premchand's Shatranj Ki uh, Obviously, we read that in translation <coughs> and then we followed that up by reading another text. And obviously, before that, we read uh, Twelfth Night by William Shakespeare. And we looked at the theoretical components of this course. We looked at certain critical terms which are important for this particular course. Uh, and then, of course, we covered two texts, uh, you know, looking at those texts from lenses of uh, gender and literature and how gender plays out politically, discursively, socially uh, in those texts. Now, what we'll do today as part of the, uh, you know, the entire uh, study of gender and how gender plays out in certain social and political conditions, we'll look at a novel which is profoundly political. We'll look at uh, a novel called Heart of Darkness by Joseph Conrad. Now, uh, before I dive into the novel, which I will in a minute, uh, I just wanted to give you a background uh, of what the novel is, uh, what kind of a cultural context uh, sort of generated this novel. Because, you know, one of the things I keep saying in this course, uh, as I'm sure you, you must have heard it from other tutors who taught you literature, uh, cultural studies, is that every literary text is born of a certain context, uh, is produced out of a certain context, uh, is generated out of a certain cultural context. Uh, so, and that cultural context uh, includes uh, the political context, the gender context, the ideological context, uh, the racial context. So, all these things come together, uh, and you know, any good reading of a literary text will require the unpacking. You know, we need to decode uh, the different cultural contexts which are embedded uh, in that literary text. Uh, and Heart of Darkness by Joseph Conrad is a supreme example. Uh, of a literary text which is profoundly political in the sense that it comes out of a certain racial, ideological and cultural context and of course it's deeply political as well. So when we look at Heart of Darkness by Conrad as a text which is very rich in terms of what it offers uh, for us interested in gender and literature, we will also take into account <coughs> you know, the different other uh, critical currents which come into it uh, including the political condition, the imperial condition, the racial condition. Uh, you know, the human condition which is sort of, you know, generated out of these different uh, dichotomies, right. So, uh, just to give you a background of this, uh, to this novel, the cultural condition which produced this novel, this was written uh, in the last decades, you know, 1899, which was the last year of the uh, 19th century. But this was a time, culturally speaking, which was, you know, full of contradictions. Because on one hand, we have, you know, imperialism reaching its highest point. Uh, on one hand, we have uh, you know, you know the European empires. They sort of they're going out. They they're really flourishing economically. Uh, you know, lots of money is sort of coming in from the colonies, and that's sort of contributing towards the richness of the European metropolis, etc. Uh, and obviously, you know, imperialism is beginning to be seen as not an exploitative mission, but a civilizing mission, which was one of the many ways in which it was legitimized uh, as an activity. Uh, so, as a political activity, imperialism sort of masqueraded. Uh, as a civilizing mission. So it was the uh, white man's burden, uh, as Kipling put it, and I'll come back to Kipling because he's a very important writer to look at when you're reading Conrad. Uh, it was a white man's burden to civilize the natives, give him education, give him a religion, give him a civilization. Uh, you know, so this was a time where this kind of a discursive undercurrent was there. Uh, you know, it was a very good time uh, for you know, the European empires. But equally, this was also the time where uh, lots of xenophobic fears were coming into being. And by xenophobic, um, by, you know, by the term xenophobic, as you know, uh, it means the fear of the other. Xeno means other, and phobia is, of course, fear. So the fear of the other was something which was uh, prevalent massively uh, in late 19th century uh, Europe, Western Europe, especially uh, you know, uh, Imperial Europe. Because you know, when you're going out to conquer colonies, when you're going out uh, to sort of civilize natives, 
uh, you're also being exposed increasingly to people who are others, who look you know, different from you, who speak different from you, who have a different kind of a civilization, who have a different kind of religion. So this was a time also where otherness was discursively and systematically formulated. Right? Uh, and of course, uh, the moment I say, uh, the moment I mention this, otherness is being discursively formulated. You know that what I'm talking about is what we now call in our uh, common parlance as racism. So this was a time when racism was beginning to be systematized, uh, and obviously, it, we all know that racism operated on a binaristic principle. So it was a European civilized uh, male uh, looking at uh, the non-European uncivilized barbarian, right. So, it was European logic against non-European anarchy, it was European whiteness against non-European blackness, right. Uh, so, this was a dichotomy, this was a very blunt uh, binaristic system which basically informed the ethos of imperialism, the discourse of imperialism if you will. So, uh, on the one hand you are sort of othering the non-European, uh, but simultaneously the moment you other something as an entity or as an object or as a human being or as a subject. Uh, you are also fearful of the other, because the other is something you do not know, the other is something which you think is mysterious. Uh, you sort of invest a mystery quotient into the other. Okay? So, this is something which was happening at that point of time. So, the, the fear of the other was rampant uh, in Western Europe, especially colonial and imperial Europe. And if you look at the literature of the times, and this is where you know it gets interesting, because if you look at how literature is reflective of this condition of otherness. If you look at the literature of the times, you find uh, lots of uh, a lot a big part of the popular literature which was being written at that point of time deals with the fear of the other, uh, someone coming in from outside, right? Or worse, and more problematically, someone who is inside you but actually is the ontological opposite of you. And two very good examples of that uh, uh, would be uh, a Bram Stoker's Dracula where the other comes from outside, uh, is a vampiric count who comes in uh, is vampiric, so he wants to infect England entirely and also uh, he is an economic other as well, because he wants to come and buy away the entire England. So, that, that is also there and uh, more problematically if you look at something like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde by Robert Louis Stevenson, where the other is not somewhere, someone outside Europe, the other is someone inside you. So, the, the very person who is Dr. Jekyll transforms into Mr. Hyde. Uh, who is obviously the ontological opposite of the European civilized man. Okay? So, this was a time which produced a lot of literature of panic, uh, panic of the other, racial panic, uh, you know, panic of you know, being contaminated, panic of losing your hygienic purity, uh, panic of losing your racial purity, panic of uh, becoming something else about you know, from what you really are as a European, panic of becoming uncivilized uh, and also equally the panic of going native which is what happens in Heart of Darkness to a great extent. Uh, part of the panic in Heart of Darkness, uh, which is of course a political panic, is precisely because uh, you know, it's, it's, it sort of stems from the fact that the European person uh, goes native and in the process he betrays the civilization, in the process he betrays his mission, in the process he exposes the hollowness and the very exploitative, atavistic, animalistic idea of nature, the quality of imperialism. So, the reason why Heart of Darkness is a profoundly political text is because it exposes colonialism and imperialism as a very nakedly exploitative enterprise. It does not disguise imperialism as a civilizing mission. It does not look at imperialism as some kind of a holy mission, uh, a romantic mission, uh, although, although that attempt is there, but it is a novel which shows it quite clearly that this entire project of looking at imperialism as some kind of a romantic holy uh, missionary civilizing enterprise is a hollow project, is a hypocritical project because what lies beneath the entire rhetoric of romance, uh, of civilizing mission etcetera is a very naked animalistic nature of imperialism which is uh, essentially an exploitative enterprise. Now, the point is uh, when we look at Heart of Darkness from the lenses of gender studies, it, it begins to get really interesting and complicated and complex because you know we look at imperialism obviously as some kind of a male project, as something which uh, is profoundly patriarchal. Uh, it completely comes from the phallogocentric principle of control uh, of you know uh, invasion, of inquest, uh, of territorialization etcetera uh, and by phallogocentric I mean a combination of the phallocentric and the logocentric right. So, it was a patriarchal logic uh, which is suggested by the term phallocentric, phallogocentric. Uh, so, the entire phallogocentric enterprise of looking at 
the non-European as the uncivilized other and you know imperialism then automatically and by default uh, extends into becoming an activity which is a civilizing mission. This entire idea is a deeply patriarchal, male-centric, masculinist project. Right? And Heart of Darkness is an interesting example of how this masculinist project collapses, fails. So, and from, uh, from one perspective, it's a novel, it's a really rich and complex novel about masculinity crisis. And equally, it's a novel about the tragedy of the female, the female condition in Heart of Darkness. Okay? So, this is something, uh, this is a kind of a dialectic uh, which plays constantly in Heart of Darkness. And what we will do in the course of this text, so first lecture, this particular lecture where I will talk about Heart of Darkness, we will be spent almost entirely looking at the cultural condition which produced the novel and simultaneously uh, the gender condition. So, what were the condition of uh, the, the woman in England, the woman in, in Western Europe at the time of imperialism? Were they really benefiting from imperialism? Uh, or did they have an agency? Were they really flourishing uh, from imperialism? Or uh, was it entirely a male project uh, run by the men and enjoyed by the men and completely and clinically controlled by the men? So, these are the questions which we will try to explore and unpack as we move on with this particular lecture on Heart of Darkness. <coughs> now, as I mentioned, it was written in 1899, it was published in Blackwood magazine first of all. Uh, and then obviously that was a magazine which published subsequently most of Conrad's other works. But uh, those of you interested in Joseph Conrad's works and life as a writer would know that he was of a Polish origin. So, he came from Poland uh, and obviously his real name is a Polish name which is a huge name. But uh, he learned English much later and began to write in English at a very you know, mature and almost middle aged age of 40. Uh, so, he published his first novel when he was in his 40s. Uh, so, he was someone who learned English and you can see uh, the entire uh, you know idea of learned English in Conrad's writing. So, his writing is something which is not effortless, effusive uh, or free flowing unlike the writings of the later modernists uh, who would come and take the legacy of Conrad and then extend it and problematize it even further. But when Conrad is writing you find uh, one of the things you notice as a reader is the is the ontological and the narratological density of Conrad's works. Uh, and by narratological density, I mean the complexity uh, in the very narrative of Conrad. So, for instance, if you start reading Heart of Darkness, you would realize it is a 90 page novel, it is almost a novella. Uh, and there are many critics who consider Heart of Darkness as a novella and not an entire novel. It is very short, it is probably one of the shortest novels ever written. Uh, one could make a valid argument of it being an extended short story. However, you find that when you read Heart of Darkness uh, as a reader, uh, it is a really, really dense novel and it takes you an enormous amount of time to read it. And the reason behind it is the ontological and the narratological density that Conrad packs into this particular novel. It is a really, really dense novel in terms of what happens, in terms of what does not happen, uh, the things which do take place and equally the things which do not take place uh, are all equally important in the context of Heart of Darkness. Now, uh, as I mentioned, this is a novel written at the time of a sort of a cultural panic, a panic of contamination, a panic of the loss of racial and hygienic purity, a panic of the you know the cultural other uh, who's coming back to invade you, etc. So this was the uh, you know the, the context which produced *Heart of Darkness*. Now, the entire novel is a flashback narration about a man called Marlowe who is a narrator in Conrad's, uh, he often is a narrator of many novels in Conrad including Lord Jim uh, and several other novels that Conrad had written. So, Marlowe is a narrator inside uh, you know that, that particular uh, you know novel. So, he is the one who tells the story, he is a storyteller uh, and he, interestingly he is a sailor storyteller uh, who is someone who has been to really exotic places and now he comes back to his European mates and tells them stories about what happened uh, in non-European uh, quote unquote atavistic spaces which include obviously Africa, the dark continent, the you know the, the sort of mysterious the dark continent. And it is a very interesting study which we will do in the course of this lecture and the following lecture is to look at the racial other as some kind of a, a feminized kind of a landscape. Uh, it is like uh, you know what Freud and the psychoanalysts later on would describe the female as this mysterious dark continent something which is not really uh, sort of inscrutable if you are using the phallocentric logic. It is inscrutable, it is ununderstandable uh, if you are using uh, the, 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 the productive logic uh, of patriarchy uh, of you know phallocentricism that would not work. So, the entire Eurocentric logic, the entire uh, ethos of Eurocentric logic which had informed the enlightenment 
uh, will not work uh, in an attempt to understand the quote unquote dark continent. So the only way you can understand the dark continent is by conquering it. The only way you can understand Africa and Africans is by conquering it, is by invading it. And the very act of invasion, obviously, is a very, very uh, masculinist act. Uh, it's, almost, it's, it's a very uh, phallocentric kind of an act where you penetrate into the dark continent uh, and you invade it, you classify it, uh, you, you know, cartographically it's classified, uh, territorially it's classified, and then obviously it becomes available for exploitation, etc. So at the very beginning, uh, so the picture I'm trying to give you is imperialism worked. Uh, the very ethos, the very fundamental ethos of imperialism relied on this male-female binary. So the male obviously was equated with the European Eurocentric logic, uh, the, the principle of production which informed imperialism. So the entire uh, logic of knowledge, the entire logic of productivity, the entire logic of uh, you know, uh, life, understanding, these are, these are very male constructs. Now, as opposed to these, we have the female, uh, you know, illogic, anarchic uh, activities, which are very easily and conveniently equated with the African other. So what we see immediately, and this is something we've been talking about even earlier, what we see immediately is a very easy and problematic equation between the racial other and the gendered other. So in a very interesting sense, the African man and the white woman begins to occupy uh, the same kind of a discursive plane uh, in terms of their being controlled by the white male, by the European white male. Because the European white male would attempt to control the African male as well as the white woman in equal measures. And of course, when you come to the African woman, the black woman, uh, she is doubly marginalized as a subject. A, on account of her gender, and B, of course, on account of her race. And we will look at a character in Heart of Darkness uh, who uh, sort of embodies this double marginalization. Right? Someone is doubly marginalized uh, as a human being. And we will we'll look at the character uh, you know, in great details in our understanding of Heart of Darkness as a rich text, a rich literary text, which looks at the, the relationship between politics and gender the relationship between ideology and gender, the relationship between imperialism and gender. So to put it, uh, to sort of summarize before we move on into a more nuanced understanding of the text, uh, Heart of Darkness uh, belongs to that point of imperialism where imperialism was essentially a phallocentric enterprise, a very male masculinist enterprise. But equally, it also belongs to that point in imperialism where we have the beginning of ambivalence, right? So ambivalence uh, as a as a category, ambivalence as a state of being is beginning to become, beginning to form in Heart of Darkness. So no, no longer are you absolutely certain about the nobility of imperialism. No longer are you absolutely certain about the, uh, the, the, the heightened, civilizing, um, you know, ennobling nature of imperialism. You are beginning to understand imperialism as some kind of an exploitative enterprise and you begin to question it, you begin to problematize it, you begin to critique it, uh, interrogate it. So all these things come into Heart of Darkness is in a very interesting way, especially in the way the narrator in Heart of Darkness, uh, Marlow, you know, in a, he, he tries to tell you what happens in Congo, but he cannot. Right? So the entire novel can be seen as a failure of this masculinist project, as a failure of this masculinist project to tame the non-European other and also to tame the white European woman. Okay? Now obviously uh, there are quite a few white European women in Heart of Darkness. Uh, who do appear at various sections of the novel, and we look at his novels and look at his characters in great detail as we move on. But the interesting thing is that they are nowhere, uh, you know, they, they don't feature at all in the very heart of the imperial machinery. They are not part of the way imperialism works. They do not uh, benefit from it. They don't really uh, have any important positions in terms of the imperial machinery. So, you know, they are just bystanders. They are just very passive bystanders uh, who A, uh, are romantic presence or B, are intimidating presence. So, either they are fearful, either they get a phobic quality when looking at them as Malo does when he looks at a woman uh, in a Belgian office or they are these passively romantic entities uh, who are sort of, you know, romantically lied to uh, like Kurtz has intended in the novel uh, who gets a false report of Kurtz's dying words, uh, a section which we'll look at in great details as we move on with the novel. Now, just to uh, you know, tell you the story of Heart of Darkness. So what happens in Heart of Darkness? In many ways, uh, it's an anti-novel. 
uh, is in many ways it doesn't really have a story. In many ways, uh, one could read Heart of Darkness as a failed attempt to tell a story. Uh, so there is no story at all in a sense. Uh, it's someone's attempt to frame and design a story, an attempt which ends with failure. Right? So it, it not, it's, it's, a, it's a very successful novel about the failure of narration. So there is, it's a, it has a paradoxical quality to it, if you look at it that way. Right? So it's a novel which wants to tell you what happened in a Congo. It's a novel which ha wants to tell you what happened with the, uh, you know, the, the European main, male uh, you know, invaders and imperialists who went to Congo with a very holy mission uh, of you know, civilizing natives, uh, carrying on the tenets of imperialism, uh, what happened to them. Uh, and then obviously, uh, and more problematically, it's also a story about the European man uh, who goes native or who turns into a bit of a renegade. Uh, who turns into someone uh, who directs himself against imperialism. And we look at the character of Colonel Kutz. Uh, and he's not a colonel in the novel, but he's just called Kutz. Uh, he's someone who was sent to the colonies in, in order to you know, carry on the work of imperialism. But he's someone who turns uh, renegade, he turns rogue. Uh, and then someone called Malo is sent to find him. Right? So Malo's entire mission is to go sail into the Congo and find out where Kutz lives. Uh, and then to, to, to recover Kurtz, to bring him back to Europe. Because, you know, Kurtz is this perfect European construct. Kurtz is someone who is trained by Europe. Kurtz is someone who is, uh, you know, uh, created by Europe. Uh, and is so sort of sent into the non-European space to work for the European machinery of imperialism. But equally, he's someone uh, who becomes a rogue agent. Uh, so he's someone who, is, who becomes a problem for imperialism. So and then another person, another agent has to be sent to bring him back. It's a very familiar kind of a narrative model. And there are many uh, adventure stories, there are many quest narratives which follow this particular novel. So, you know, one bigger man goes and turns a renegade, and then a smaller man goes in with an attempt to bring him back uh, into the hegemonic uh, imperialist machinery. And obviously, the attempt ends with failure. Okay? Now, uh, so Heart of Darkness begins, uh, if you read the novel, if you look at the beginning of the novel, the, the opening of the novel, it begins in a little boat called Nelly. Uh, which is sailing in the river Thames in London. And there's Marlowe, who's obviously the narrator in Heart of Darkness, and he's telling a story of what happened in Congo to a few you know, you know, men who are sort of sitting in a boat, uh, you know, basically just lazing around. They're professional men with white collar jobs, uh, working in London, presumably. But they are people who are you know, listening to Marlowe's, presumably listening to Marlowe's narrative. Now, what we find in the novel is very quickly, uh, most of the people who listen to the narrative of Marlowe, they get bored. They go off to sleep. They are completely disinterested, except the main narrator. So the main narrator, the first person presence in Sir Heart of Darkness, is someone who is a, probably the only person who keenly listens to Marlowe's narrative. So you have different uh, narrative uh, designs in Heart of Darkness. So it almost has a Chinese box quality to it. So we have uh, the main narrator, whose name we don't know, is presumably a European white man. Uh, he's definitely a male. And he's telling us the story, uh, the story of Marlowe's story, uh, the story of Marlowe's attempt to tell a story. And inside his narration is obviously the main narration of Marlowe, uh, who is trying to tell you, uh, which is trying to tell you, the narration is trying to tell you what happened to Marlowe in Congo uh, when he went to work for a Belgian company. Uh, and then obviously he was also given the mission to bring a someone called Kutz back, K-U-R-T-Z, Kutz back to the empire, right? And obviously the entire mission becomes a failed mission, and it becomes a mission of failure completely. <clears throat> now we have, it's, it's a novel almost entirely dominated by men, right? Uh, and that is reflective, of, obviously, of the entire machinery of imperialism, which is very white, very male, very phallogocentric. And it's this entire logic, this entire phallogocentric male logic, which you know, informed imperialism historically, ideologically, economically, as well as culturally. Right? So the presence of the female, the, the agency of the female in Heart of Darkness uh, was quite limited. And of course, we remember uh, you know, the text we did previously before we came here, uh, Shatran Shikilari by Munshi Premchand. Now, in that, in that short story too, we saw the, the agency of the woman is quite limited, it's quite constrained, despite the fact that she is someone, the woman, the woman in Premchand's stories are people who could have been much better administrators if they had the agency. But you know, it's all controlled by the men. It's all controlled by the males uh, who basically are very inefficient and who end up doing nothing. And then obviously the entire kingdom goes off to the East India Company as we saw when we read the short story.
Now, in the case of heart of darkness, obviously the men are very efficient. Uh, they are white European, you know, Western European men uh, who want to make as much profit as they can from the uh, you know, non-European, non-Western territories uh, in Africa, including the Congo. So the Congo becomes a metaphor over here uh, of the female space, the female space which uh, you know, can be territorialized. Right? And I use the word territorialize quite uh, complexly. It's a very complex word. Uh, territorializing a space means you're going and invading a space. And it's a very phallic kind of an invasion. Uh, the men, uh, the imperial men go and territorialize a non-European space. And obviously what follows thereafter is a system of economic exploitation where all the raw materials including uh, you know, teak, uh, you know, tea, you know, oil, uh, any kind of materials which can be used for industrial purposes are shipped back to the European uh, centers. So, the, the colonies become the margins, the colonies become the, the places where the dirty job of imperialism is done, right? The dirty job of exploitation, torture, uh, you know, and we saw when we read uh, George Orwell's essay, Shooting an Elephant, that you know, there is this ambivalence uh, about you know, seeing the naked machinery of imperialism uh, happen in front of you. Right? So, uh, when, when you are out there in the colonies, when you are out there at the very heart uh, of imperialism, that is the reason why this novel is called The Heart of Darkness. So, the darkness away up is not so much African darkness, it is a darkness which comes out of the brutality of imperialism. So, you can read it both ways. It is a darkness which emerges, which is generated out of the brutality of imperialism, uh, out of the uh, torture of imperialism, out of this naked exploitative uh, in the face of imperialism, uh, which is hidden of course, which is concealed from the European centers. But what happens when you actually go to the margins? What happens if you like George Orwell, you actually go to the very belly of imperialism and see how it works uh, in its naked um, you know, in exploitative machinery. So, this is what the novel is all about, Heart of Darkness. Right? So, Marlow, the narrator of Heart of Darkness, the inset narrator of Heart of Darkness, someone who is telling the story and of course, there is this unnamed narrator who tells the story back to us. So, there are different levels of narration as we just mentioned. So, Marlow is someone who is hired by a Belgian company. It is an unnamed Belgian company uh, who sends him to Congo and obviously, the Belgians in Congo uh, you know and if you look at any history of imperialism, you will find that uh, you know in most occasions when for instance, when British came to India, uh, the French went to uh, Algeria. Uh, along with the exploitative mission, there was also an attempt uh, to sort of uh, masquerade it, to dress it up uh, uh, in a less guilty kind of a way as some kind of a civilizing romantic mission. But as Noam Chomsky says in an interview, uh, you know, uh, the Belgian imperialism in Congo is the only exception where even no, no attempt is even made uh, to dress it up as some kind of a civilizing mission. It was from the very start a brutal exploitative machinery. So, the very metaphor of Belgians in the Congo becomes the metaphor of white exploitation of non-white races, uh, white territorialization of non-white spaces. Right? So, there is no attempt at all uh, uh, you know, on the part of the Belgians uh, to, to, to convert it, to sort of you know, overtly convert it into some kind of a, uh, a missionary uh, or civilizing mission. The attempt is missing, you know, the, you know, they do not even bother, they did not even historically bother to dress it up as some kind of a civilizing mission. So, from the very inception, the Belgian imperialism in Congo was an imperialism which was completely governed by the profit principle with a very male, phallocentric, masculinist profit principle. So, what I am trying to give you is an idea of how the words male and female, uh, they transcend uh, the, the biological uh, you know the biological bodies, the biological entities and they become uh, almost cultural uh, ideological entities. So, the very ideology of imperialism, of exploitation and that becomes a very male project. Uh, it becomes a male fantasy of profit principles. So, the, the, is the European men that want to go to the non European spaces with a sole purpose, with a sole motive of making profit, right? And that entire capitalist machinery of making profit, the entire capitalist fantasy of making endless profit is a very male, phallocentric fantasy, right? Now, obviously, as I mentioned, the African space, the non white space, becomes a very feminized kind of a landscape which can be territorialized and invaded by the white invaders, by the white imperialists. So, as you can see and this is something which we had talked about even before uh, when we you know, looked at uh, Prem Chand's Shatan Jukilari, we looked at uh, you know, how, in the shooting the elephant by George Orwell, uh, the, the very complex relationship between space and gender. Uh, 
right? So space is essentially and problematically and dis discursively gendered. So space emerges as a gendered identity. So over here, uh, you know, in a nutshell, the African space, the non-European, the non-white space becomes a very feminized kind of a landscape which can be very conveniently territorialized and invaded by the white male phallocentric imperialists. So this is a premise in Heart of Darkness. This is a premise with which the novel starts. And of course, we see uh, as we read the novel, it becomes increasingly complex in terms of its relationship between uh, gender and performativity, gender and race, gender and space, gender and different systems of economy. Right? So in Heart of Darkness, we have the, uh, the very naked capitalist system of profit making, uh, uh, which is what governs the Belgian presence in the Congo. Uh, and like I said a little while ago, uh, you know, the Belgians historically did not even attempt uh, to convert or make the imperialism look like a civilized mission. Uh, so they were very, in, in a way, they were honest about it, you know, uh, nakedly honest about it. So they sort of, it was completely in your face. Everyone was there. Everyone could see that it was just uh, a profit-making, exploitative enterprise. So it was entirely dependent. It was entirely based on the sole motive of making profit. Right? So any other motive was missing, any other attempt to make it look something else was missing. It didn't work. I mean, they didn't bother to do it. Unlike the British uh, who in India, you know, they, they try to play up uh, this entire idea of civilizing the Indians, uh, rescuing them from barbaric rituals. Uh, so in a way, uh, it would have historically made them less guilty in terms of you know, what they really did economically, uh, politically and culturally. But in the Belgians in the Congo, they did not even attempt to masquerade as something else. They were just naked profit-making imperialists. Uh, and the entire idea of imperialism was a very male, masculinist, phallocentric idea. So this is something I want to, uh, you know, you to understand in terms of looking at, uh, you know, the gendered performativity. Because remember, one of the things I've been talking about from the very beginning is that gender transcends biological determinism. So gender is, doesn't really depend on biology all the time. Right? So, uh, you know, imperialism doesn't have a biological body. Imperialism doesn't have uh, an organic body. But the very ethos of imperialism are, are very, very male. The very ideology of imperialism, the very uh, intention of imperialism is a very male, masculinist fantasy. And in that sense, it's gendered as a male. And in that sense, it's gendered as a male object. And equally, uh, whenever you have a male object, trying to dominate or territorialize uh, the other, the other becomes by default the female object, the exotic female. So we find in Heart of Darkness how Africa is exoticized. Uh, it becomes a completely different kind of environment where the cognitive principle of European logic will not work. So uh, there are many occasions in the novel, and we look at those occasions in, a, in, a, in subsequent classes uh, as we move on in, in more textual details about this uh, novel, where the entire logical understanding of the European man collapses when he moves into this quote-unquote atavistic, uh, anarchic female space of the Congo. So the, the river Congo in which Malu sails into in order to find goods becomes almost like an amniotic kind of a fluid. Uh, which is taking him in the womb, the female womb, where the male logic will not work anymore. So if you contrast Congo uh, with London, so London in the novel is very, very uh, phallocentric. We have these high buildings, we have these capitalist offices, we have these you know, big uh, you know, commercial offices built on either banks, on either sides of the River Thames, uh, and it's all very uh, classified uh, and you know, neatly laid out cartographically, etc. And if you contrast that, uh, cartographic logic with the very anarchic, quote unquote anarchic, amniotic, uh, fluid like quality of Congo, you find immediately that the two can be gendered as male and female respectively. And the male logical principle completely collapses in Congo. Uh, and we have a very interesting uh, strategy that Conrad uses. Uh, it's a narrative strategy called delayed decoding. And we'll talk about delayed decoding later, but just to give you a very quick idea of what delayed decoding is. Marlow, uh, Marlow's entire idea, Marlow's entire effort to decode what's happening around him is delayed. Because you know, his tool, the apparatus he has to decode the environment around him, to navigate the way around him, the apparatus is a very Eurocentric, phallocentric apparatus, which does not work in that kind of a setting. So again, we find how things like logic, things like knowledge, which we assume to be universals, they are actually local productions. So they are produced locally. They are context sensitive. 
So what is knowledge in a certain context becomes a non-knowledge uh, and ignorance in another context. So knowledge, logic, uh, the entire idea of rationality which governed European enlightenment, uh, all these things are revealed, this master narratives, this grand narratives of imperialism, of enlightenment are revealed to be very, very local narratives in Heart of Darkness. And in that sense, it's a novel about dissolution, it's a novel about cynicism. So the entire novel is a very cynical take on enlightenment, it's a very cynical take on uh, imperialism, it's a very cynical take on the entire masculinist uh, profit motive which governed imperialism. So you know, in that sense, it becomes a very, very interesting novel. Okay? So uh, hopefully you have an idea uh, of the gendered, idea, gendered quality of the ethos of imperialism as it reveals, as, as it emerges in Heart of Darkness. Okay? So the very idea of imperialism is a, in, is a very male idea with which the protagonists uh, move into Congo. Now, uh, having given you in a nutshell uh, the, 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 the cultural condition of the time, so I just mentioned that this is also a time of cultural panic. Now, before I move into the novel very quickly, I just want to give you two more terms, uh, which were uh, very, very interesting and important if you want to do a solid cultural study uh, of the condition which produced Heart of Darkness. The two uh, terms which I'll give you, A, are degeneration and B, criminology. So degeneration was a fear of devolution. Because remember, this is also the term, time when social Darwinism, which is a polite way to you know, describe racism, social Darwinism was beginning to be systematized. Right? This is a time when the Europeans were uh, encountering the non-Europeans, uh, obviously they were exploiting the non-Europeans and part of the exploitation strategy was to make them other. So the non-Europeans appeared to be barbaric, uncivilized, a different species altogether. Right? So there was a lot of hesitation in you know, looking at them as being part of the same human species which contained the Europeans. Right? So the non-Europeans, they were considered to be the racial other, almost like a different species I just mentioned. And that fueled the fear of uh, you know, degeneration. So the, uh, you know, the, there was this possibility of contamination. Uh, but obviously, uh, you know, the contamination is happening because the Europeans are going to the non-European spaces to exploit. They take away the natural resources, they take away the economic resources. Uh, so that's all very good. But what is not so good uh, is the possibility of contamination. It's the possibility of coming too close to the natives, too close for comfort, right? And that, in a way, uh, makes the European panic. So the culture of degeneration was rampant at that time. So, you know, uh, and, and so likewise was the culture of uh, criminology. So criminology uh, was, again, a systematic study of criminality. And interestingly, criminality was equated with race, uh, very conveniently. Uh, so uh, the criminal often uh, was equated with the African. Right? So the African is a criminal by default. The African is a, a rapist by default. The African is a plunderer by default. The African is uh, lazy by default. The African is exploitative by default. So the entire uh, you know, investment of negative attributes into the African was obviously a European strategy of othering. Okay? And criminology, uh, a system of study of the criminals and criminality uh, through physiognomic markers was something which was uh, uh, developed more sophisticatedly and they used a sophisticated with some kind of a irony in it by someone called Cesar Lombroso, L-O-M-B-R-O-S-O, -O, Lombroso, Cesar Lombroso. So Lombroso was an Italian thinker uh, who basically designed the entire discourse of criminology whereby uh, he sort of, you know, and, and different scientists, different social scientists uh, took it off from there uh, and they were in, in very popular parlance and consumption and circulation, there was this rhetoric of the uh, criminal African, uh, of the violent African, of the African who goes violent, of the African who is potentially dangerous, as African who is potentially anarchic. So, you know, this entire fear of anarchy, contamination, uh, atavism, all these things fueled, uh, you know, the European fear of being contaminated, the European fear of, you know, devolution or degeneration. So, in a very interesting sense, the idea, the fear of degeneration is also the, is, is also a very male fear, right? Uh, it, it goes against the male fantasy of perfection. It goes against the male fantasy of control, the male fantasy of exploitation, the male fantasy of humanism. Right? Uh, the fear of devolution, the fear of being uh, you know, contaminated by the criminal is something which goes against the entire white male fantasy of control, conquest and clinical perfection.
So if you read something like uh, Bram Stoker's Dracula, if you read something like uh, no, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, and then of course if you read something like Heart of Darkness, which you will read uh, as part of this course, you find this entire fear of being contaminated by the other, by the African, is something which is rampant in the novel. It's rampant in that cultural conditions which produce this novel. And the question, the automatic question which, which you know, extends from this particular argument is, how were the women, how were the European white women uh, located in this entire dialectic of profit and panic? So on the one hand, you're making profit by going out and by being imperialist. On the other hand, this entire idea of profit is also generating the idea of the fear of panic, the culture of panic. So this profit panic loop, which basically informs imperialism, late 19th century imperialism, needs to be looked at, needs to be reviewed in my mind with a gendered study. So the profit is gendered, the panic is uh, gendered as male, the panic is gendered as female. Because you know, the only way in which contamination can happen is through the encounter with the sexual other, which is a female. So again, we see how the sexual other and the racial other, they are sort of, you know, equated very, very conveniently. Right? So the encounter with the racial sexual other, which is what happens in Heart of Darkness, is a very, very interesting encounter because that completely destroys the European idea of enlightenment, the European idea of logic, reason, rationality, and phallogocentricity. Right? So uh, Heart of Darkness uh, is about a man called Kutz, K-U-R-T-Z. Now Kutz uh, is, we, we get to know very little about Kutz, so Marlowe is given a mission. When Marlowe the narrator joins his Belgian company, uh, he is given a mission to go to the heart of Congo and to find out about Kurtz and if possible bring him back. Now who is Kurtz? Kurtz is a renegade imperialist. Kurtz is someone who was a perfect imperialist, someone who was produced by imperialism, someone who was support, supposed to go and extend the ethos of imperialism, make it perfect, as perfect as possible. But he ironically becomes a renegade. He ironically becomes part of the other. So he essentially is contaminated, right? He's contaminated by the quote unquote touch of evil, the African evil, and he becomes more African than the African. So essentially he becomes a problem. He becomes a huge problem for the European imperialists who now have to find a way, devise a way in bringing him back or to kill him. Because he becomes a bit of a, uh, you, know, you know, a lord in that kind of a setting. So he is sent by the European imperialists, but once he's there, uh, he's too good a soldier, uh, you know, to be controlled by imperialism. So he starts his own private imperial enterprise, which goes against the ethos of the grander imperial enterprise. So he becomes a problem for imperialism, a problem which must be plucked off, right? An entire project of Marlowe is to pluck off Kurtz, to go to Heart of Darkness, to, to Congo, and to find out about Kurtz, and to bring him back, or to kill him. But of course, the entire novel is about a failure the failure to tame Kurtz, the failure to control Kurtz, the failure to bring him back. So in, at many levels, it's a failure of the male fantasy. It's a failure of the male fantasy to control the female, right? To control the anarchic female, which is obviously equated with the African. Now, who are the women in Heart of Darkness? And I'll talk about the women in more details in my next lecture. But just to give you an idea of the way the women appear in Heart of Darkness, the emotions that a woman embody in Heart of Darkness are a, either fear, so either you're intimidated by the woman or you are sympathetic to the woman. Either you patronize the woman or you're petrified by the woman. Okay? So the woman can either be a medusa or a very passive persona who is going to consume any lie that a male will give to her uh, about imperialism. Right? So the two most important female characters in Heart of Darkness are Kutz's African mistress in Congo. She's one character, uh, again, we don't know her name, we, know, we don't know the name of any Africans uh, in Congo. They never have a voice, they don't have a name, they don't have a voice. The entire novel is spoken from a Eurocentric perspective, so the entire logic of narration uh, is a Eurocentric logic of narration. Uh, so we don't have a voice for the uh, African mistress of Kurtz, but equally and interestingly, we don't have a name uh, of the, uh, the woman that Kurtz is supposed to marry uh, in Brussels, the white woman. So even the white woman does not have a name in Heart of Darkness. Even the white woman is unnamed in Heart of Darkness, which obviously points to, his, uh, to her agency-lessness. She doesn't really have any real agency right, in Heart of Darkness. So in that sense, the white woman who was supposed to marry Kurtz, the fiancé of Kurtz, uh, and the black 
um, you know, mistress of goods, they occupy a very similar plane. So, both are determined, both are uh, described through the male lens. So, the entire identity is a dependent, uh, is apropos of a male. Um, you know the male sexual identity, the male political identity, the male social identity. So, Kutz's intended is just that, she is Kutz's intended, just she is Kutz's fiance, that is the only identity she has in this particular novel. So, she is a white Belgian woman uh, you know living in Brussels, but that is that's the only thing we know about her, we do not know anything about her except for the fact that she was supposed to marry Kutz. Right? And that is very, very reflective of the tragic condition of the woman under imperialism. So, even the white woman, the supposedly powerful white woman uh, was equally in the dark, was equally imprisoned by the imperialists as the black African mistress. And the black African mistress uh, does not say anything in Heart of Darkness, but she utters a scream. I mean, she, she, she looks in a particular way. Uh, she uh, gives out a sound uh, which is obviously prelingual, uh, quote unquote prelingual, and that makes her uh, a very exotic savage. So, this very idea of being an exotic savage in Heart of Darkness again is a male fantasy. So, whatever the, the European Eurocentric rational logical male cannot understand must be converted into savagery by default. It is like black magic. And you know, have you ever wondered uh, about the term black magic? Why is it black? It is black because it, it, it falls outside the purview uh, of the European Eurocentric rationality, the very purview of Eurocentric scientific logic. Right? So, because it falls outside the purview of that scientific logic, it becomes black by default. Right? So, it, you know, even in small quote unquote minor words, minor adjectives, we have the racial undertones. So, you know, uh, deeply embedded, so deeply packed in. And obviously, it is not difficult to see how the racial undertone uh, quickly allies itself with a gender undertone. So, the white European logical scientific understanding becomes male by default. Anything outside its purview is female by default. Right? It's a dark continent. So, if you remember, Freud described the woman as a dark continent, and that, of course, is you know is a way of looking at the woman as some kind of a mysterious other that cannot be understood by the logic of male science. So, in that sense, Heart of Darkness is entirely about an attempted male invasion into uh, a, a female space. Uh, obviously, the main invasion is through imperialism, and imperialism becomes a machinery of control, of exploitation, of torture in Heart of Darkness, which you find quite blatantly and nakedly. So, when Marlowe goes to the Belgian office and then she, he is sent to the Congo, he, like George Orwell in Shooting the Elephant, he sees the entire naked machinery of imperialism work uh, in front of him. Uh, and he, he sees the entire male profit principle in operations. There is nothing grand about imperialism, it is nothing romantic about imperialism. It is a deeply racist, it is a deeply exploitative enterprise, which is something which emerges in front of Marlowe's eyes. Right? So, he is sent there. Now, before he goes to Congo, there is a very brief section where he goes to the Belgian office in Brussels. And he, he narrates the entire thing obviously to his audience in uh, a little boat called Nelly sailing in the river Thames in London. Uh, so, the entire story is a flashback narration of what happened to him in Congo. So, he is telling the story to uh, a, a group of men uh, sitting in a boat in, in the river Thames in London. And he sort of tells them that he went to Brussels, he went to the office of this imperial uh, you know, company. And of course, the company is not named, it could be any company, it is in every company. Uh, Brussels was full of those companies at that point in time. So, the name does not matter really. So, he goes to the office, uh, and right before the office, uh, he sees a woman. You know, he sees a woman knitting wool uh, in the reception, uh, and you know, he she looks at him uh, in a very uh, interesting way, in a re with a very petrifying kind of a gaze, and that unnerves him, right? So, like I said, you e either can be petrified by the woman, or you can, uh, you know, patronize the woman. So the woman becomes either the the object of sympathy, the object of protection, or the object of fear, right? The object of contamination, the object of you know, uh, aversion. So you know, the entire gender dynamic in Heart of Darkness is very unequal, asymmetric uh, dynamic. So, the, the men belong to a certain location, the women belong to another location and the two never meet. There is no equal dialogue, there is no equal uh, interchange or exchange in Heart of Darkness at any level whatsoever. And this is an important point that I want you to ponder on. So, the entire novel Heart of Darkness, if you read the novel and we look at certain selected sections in the later lectures, we will find that the entire novel is spoken from a phallocentric perspective. But the reason why it is an interesting novel is because it sort of reveals to you very painfully that a phallocentric perspective is collapsing. 
as something which is dying, as something which is decadent. Right? It's not something which is working anymore. So on the one hand, Heart of Darkness belongs to that epoch in European imperialism, where imperialism was at its highest peak. But at the same time, even when it, when it was at its highest peak, you can still discern the decadence of imperialism. You can still discern the negative, dark metaphors of imperialism, which is beginning to you know, make their presence felt. So Heart of Darkness as a novel is about the exposure of imperialism as a dark, naked enterprise. So interestingly, the original darkness in Heart of Darkness, which was a male fantasy of the non-male, non-European space, that sort of comes back in a way. So the darkness in Heart of Darkness, in the end, is not so much the African darkness, but in the end, it turns out to be the white European darkness. Right? So it's a darkness which emerges out of the wickedness, out of the evil of imperialism. Uh, you know, and the contamination not comes from outside, but the contamination is carried by the imperialists. Okay? So this is the premise of Heart of Darkness and then we will start, start off with the text as we move on in the subsequent lecture. So before I wind up this particular lecture, I just want to leave you with one particular you know, picture of Heart of Darkness. So as I mentioned, uh, you know, theoretically speaking, objectively speaking, Heart of Darkness is the African space. Uh, which is the anti-civilization, anti-logic, anti-male kind of a space. And of course, the heart of light or the heart of enlightenment is the European space, uh, which is the birthplace for quote-unquote rationality, logic, reasoning, and the entire principle of control, of prosperity, etc. Now, what this novel does, very interestingly, uh, in the novel by Joseph Conrad does, is it brings these two spaces together and it looks at the way in which these two spaces are interchangeable. There's a very thin line, if any at all, between these two spaces. There's a very thin ontological line between these two spaces. And the leap from civilization to anarchy, the leap from logic to logiclessness, the leap from logic to lawlessness uh, is very, very short in Heart of Darkness, as exemplified by the figure of Kutz. Kutz, K U R T Z, Kutz in Heart of Darkness is a, is a figure, as I mentioned, uh, who is an embodiment of European Enlightenment. So he, uh, the novel tells you quite clearly, the entire Europe went into the making of Kutz. So Kutz is a pan-European construct. It is a construct of reason, enlightenment, logic, rationality, etc. But interestingly, this entire construct is deconstructed in Heart of Darkness. So when Kutz goes to Congo, he becomes uh, a native. He turns native. So, and what the novel does, very interestingly, I think, is it shows you the very easy transition between being the perfect civilized white man into uh, you know, being the uncivilized barbaric other who is contaminated by the uh, non-male African who is doubly marginalized. So, uh, you know, Kurtz is intended in Brussels, Kurtz is fiancé in Brussels, is this very docile, passive white woman who is very romantic, dressed up in a romantic kind of costume. Now, in complete ontological opposite of this is uh, Kurtz's mistress in Africa, Kurtz's African mistress who is all body and no mind. So, she is this very, very animalistic, uh, you know, appetitive kind of a person. So, she, she represents, uh, you know, the very carnal, corporeal, uh, the baser elements of, of human condition. So she is not uh, enlightened, she is not someone who is logical, she is not someone who is governed by the Cartesian uh, control of emotion, uh, she is not someone who is reasonable or rational, she is anti-rational. And this entire construct of the African woman as this anti-rational, uh, you know, uh, anarchic kind of an entity is obviously part of the male fantasy, part of the white male fantasy to classify the other uh, as someone who is fearful, uh, someone who should be tamed potentially, but equally someone who should be, uh, you know, uh, you know, punished. So she, she should be simultaneously punished and tamed. So she is this quote unquote uh, uncontrollable mad black woman, right, uh, who, is, who is a huge threat to the uh, European male. So she is seen in the novel as some kind uh, of, uh, of a predator of the European male. Uh, so she is someone who converts the perfect European men, uh, the perfect European male uh, into some kind of an atavistic entity. So Kurtz becomes, uh, like I said, uh, he almost gets a touch of evil. Uh, in the process he becomes a native, in the process he becomes a renegade, in the process he becomes a problem uh, to the entire uh, idea, the entire machinery of imperialism which had historically produced him.
Okay? So this is basically the premise in Heart of Darkness. Uh, an entire novel uh, in a works in this premise, entire novel uh, is a sh sh sort of shuffling between these two premises. So even in the two metropolis, even in the two spaces which are prevalent in Heart of Darkness, uh, the very white London metropolitan space which is, uh, is very male like I said. So we have this big office buildings, a very, very phallic in structure uh, and the river Thames uh, is where the, the, the men go in a boat and sail. Again, it's, it's a manly way to control the natural element. Uh, even inside London, it's a domestication of the imperial machinery uh, in a certain sense. And if, in complete contrast to that uh, is the river Congo, uh, which is this uh, pre-civilization river. And Marlowe tells you quite explicitly, uh, you know, traveling down Congo is like going back in time. So going back in time uh, is very interestingly, uh, you can connect it to the idea of uh, devolution. So on the one hand, you have evolution uh, where the European white man uh, is said to have evolved uh, from lesser species. But going back in time, interestingly, is an example of devolution where there is always this possibility of going back to where you come from, came from historically and you know, in terms of genealogy. And interestingly, as I mentioned at the very beginning of this lecture, this ties in very well to the entire collective panic at that point of time, the panic of degeneration, the panic of going back into the lesser civilized entity, the lesser civilized, uh, you know, the lower civilized uh, in a state uh, in complete opposite to the higher civilized state which is embodied by the European male. And like I said at the beginning, the, to, the to transition from the highest European male to the lowest uh, non-European, non-white entity is all but a short uh, lead. You know. So, you know, uh, Kurtz, what happens to Kurtz in Heart of Darkness is, uh, you know, is interesting because he takes that leap, he takes a step too many and then he becomes uh, from being a perfect imperial officer, a perfect imperial uh, you know, soldier, he becomes uh, into a problem that now imperialism must find a way to get rid of. So, he becomes too perfect and the process of becoming too perfect, he becomes a monster. Right. So, Kurtz is becoming a monster uh, is basically, uh, you know, it's a, it's a revelation. It exposes the naked, brutal face of imperialism, right. And now the entire imperial machinery uh, sends another agent to get rid of the former rogue agent. So, Kurtz can be seen as a rogue agent who turns against the very system which had historically created him. And Amala becomes the second agent who sent to recover the rogue agent or to kill him. And of course, the, the rogue agent. Um, you know, dies in very mysterious conditions. We never quite know whether he kills himself or whether he dies a natural death. All we know is his dying words are the horror, the horror, which is one of the most famous lines in the history of literature, the horror, the horror. These are the dying words in, 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 with, with which Kurtz dies. Uh, you know, and of course, there are multiple, there are endless interpretations of these words, uh, you know, and we look at the interpretations as we move on to the next lecture. So, hopefully, the first lecture on Heart of Darkness, uh, it has given you an idea of the cultural condition of the times. And this is a high point of imperialism, but also the high point of, uh, you know, cultural panic. This is a high point of, uh, you know, uh, capitalism as well as contamination. This is a high point of uh, profit as well as panic. This is a high point of, you know, the fear of the other as well as the taming of the other. And, you know, this entire dialectic, this entire, you know, series of contradictions is what determines the cultural conditions of the time which produced Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness. So, in the next lecture, we will move into more specifically into the way gender plays out in Heart of Darkness and how this particular novella or novel becomes a very rich text in order to look at gender, especially in relation to space and in relation to knowledge, in relation to truth, in relation to landscape and in relation to the general state of being uh, in Heart of Darkness. So, what is a female state of being? What is a male state of being? And how are these two states, uh, you know, dramatized against each other? That will be the content of our next lecture. So, thank you for listening and I will see you again very soon.